book of the Bible, uh, book of Psalms is like right in the middle, so just kind of flip open to the middle and you're bound to land very close and just look for chapter 78. Please join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, this morning we thank you for the gathering in of your saints. We thank you for the opportunity to, to be together with our brothers and sisters in Christ, those for whom Christ died. Father, we are together here today to worship you and to hear from you. So, Father, we pray that you would speak to us through your word. We are your people and we want to live our lives according to your counsel in your direction, so speak to us, Father. By your Holy Spirit, Father, I pray that you'd fill us afresh and help us, God, to have eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand and apply your word to our lives. I pray, Father, that you would change us this morning, empower us, and strengthen us, Father. For those who are coming in weary, tired, discouraged, frustrated, struggling, God, I pray that you would lift our gaze to you this morning. Please help us now, Father, for your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, Psalm 78, uh, it's, a, it's a long psalm. We're going to read the first eight verses, uh, which is where we're going to focus our time this morning, that we'll kind of drop in and out of the rest of the psalm throughout our time. So please read with me. Psalm 78, this is God's holy and authoritative word. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. May God bless the preaching and the hearing of his word. Well, this is the first message in a series that we're calling Real Godliness for Real Life. We just finished uh, almost a year long, well, no, a year long, no exaggeration, uh, series in the book of Acts that we have thoroughly enjoyed. I love the book of Acts. It's been such a good series. I hope it's been encouraging for you and strengthening for you and envisioning for you. And after this short series, we're going to launch into the book of Psalms for the rest of the year, for which we're also very excited about. But in between those two series, we thought we'd kind of sandwich in a short series called Real Godliness for Real Life. As you know, we are a church that preaches expositionally, so we take books of the Bible and just preach all the way through. Uh, but here and there, we're going to take little moments to address the church pastorally on issues that we think would be helpful. And today being Father's Day, since we just spoke on Mother's, uh, on Mother's Day, uh, we thought we would take advantage of this moment to, to give a message on the topic of fatherhood. Father's Day is not a day on the church calendar, and we don't normally focus an entire message on this topic, but again, given the timing of this, we thought it would be good and helpful to address this. But like Mother's Day, this is a day that, that we're aware is a, it's a different experience for different people in this room. This is a, uh, it's a hard day um, for some of us, maybe a sad day. There's uh, probably some of us in this room for whom this is the first day, uh, the first year that we're celebrating this day um, since dad died. Um, so it's not a great day of joy. Probably for other people, it may not be a death, but it may be a bad relationship. It may be a broken relationship right now that we're aware of, frustration and hardship. Um, and so today's a, it's a sad day. It's a, it's a difficult day. There are fathers in this room that feel regret, especially older fathers perhaps, that, uh, that are aware of, of ways that we have failed and a way, aware of things that we wish we would have done differently, wish we would have been a different sort of father. And there are men in this room that are battling infertility who want to be a father this morning. 
Guys, we know we're here and we love you and God sees you and he knows and he cares and he has grace for you this morning. Psalm 78 is a passionate plea to fathers to gladly bear responsibility for their families. It is a responsibility of passing faith on from one generation to the next. The title of this psalm in my Bible, the, the little subtitle, is Tell the Coming Generation. And that's our job as fathers, is to proclaim to the generation to come so that they might set their hope in God. It's aimed primarily at fathers, but this is not a, a call that is exclusive to fathers. This psalm is not exclusive to fathers. It's a call to the whole church. It's a call to fathers and mothers alike. The language is addressed specifically at fathers, but it is much more broad than that. In fact, there's a call in the psalm to the entire church as by to come alongside families as we disciple our children, as we proclaim to, from one generation to the next to set their hope in God. So this is a call to every one of us personally this morning. So nobody should be checking out because God's word addresses us all. But with the force of this text, I'm going to address most of my comments directed at the dads in this room, directed at the topic of fatherhood. Not going to try to in, um, cover everything that has to do with fatherhood. There's way too much to be said to do that. The Bible speaks broadly and in a lot of areas. So I'm not going to be speaking comprehensively this morning, but rather highly selectively, very focused not trying to present a holistic teaching on what it means to be a father, nor are we going to try and cover everything in the psalm. With 72 verses, God's word is rich. God's word is deep. And God's word, you know, we could spend weeks or months studying this psalm for all that it has to speak to us because it is that rich. So I'm going to focus on these first few verses and try to unpack what I find to be the primary burden of this passage. Well, what's something that's somewhat unique about this psalm. It's typically referenced, typically called a historical psalm. So it walks through the history of the people of Israel, but the first eight verses resemble more of a wisdom psalm. So the first eight verses you know, present wisdom from Asaph. Asaph is the one to whom this, uh, this psalm is attributed. And so the first eight verses really communicate the burden of the entire thing. And then the author, Asaph, goes on for the remaining 64 verses to unpack and to relentlessly just drive home over and over and over again his burden time after time in different ways and seasons of the people of God, showing them, reminding them, reminding us of the amazing grace of the Lord at work in them and in response to their weaknesses and their failures. If you're here this morning you and you're aware of failures, and you're aware of weaknesses, the good news is this psalm is directed at you and me this morning. So it's these first eight verses that we're going to focus on, what they have to tell us about faithful fathering. And that primary burden that these verses unpack, the main message is that God has called fathers to faithfully lead and nourish their families. God has called fathers to faithfully lead and nourish their families. Now, I'm trying to be very intentional in my language in this because oftentimes I heard um, a friend of mine who preached on, uh, on Father's Day a number of years ago uh, kind of talk about the difference between Mother's Day and Father's Day in church. Oftentimes, you know, Mother's Day, we, we bring, them, you know, bring moms in and we've got flowers down at the front and the kids take flowers to their moms, uh, maybe a Starbucks you know, gift card or something like that. And we've got some kind of a, uh, you know, acrostic with a, an acrostic of, of moms. You, know, you have marvelous and awesome that's it's misspelled and um, majestic mother, you know, something like that. And we honor them and we sing uh, songs and we read poetry for them. And then dads come in on Father's Day and we kind of punch them in the gut and, and say, come on, get better, slob. Pick up the pace. It's not my intent this morning to do that. No doubt God calls us to do hard things. In fact, it's, it simply doesn't get any more radical than Jesus himself telling us as husbands to lay down our lives for our wives, to lay down our lives for our children, to die to ourselves. That, there's no more radical call than that. But the call of this psalm is not some high and lofty goal of perfect parenting principles. It's a call to faithfulness. I didn't mean to alliterate that, by the way. That just, just flows. It's a call to faithfulness. It's called to love and serve the wife and the children that God has given us. It's ultimately a call to point our children and to point our wives to him. 
It's not a call to be amazing. I, I, I was laughing with my wife this morning. I drove into church, and I was in a vehicle that's, that's not mine, and um, I didn't steal it, um, in case you're wondering. And it was on a radio station that I don't normally listen to, but, but it, was a, it was an old song that I know from uh, dating myself here, Bonnie Tyler. Uh, the song is called I Need a Hero. Anybody remember that song? Is it in your head now? Okay, good, good. So I heard this song, and I was just thinking, oh, what a, what a song for Father's Day. I need a hero. I want to be that hero for my family, and I do. I want, to be, I want to be that hero, but this psalm does not call us to be heroes. It doesn't call us to be amazing men of God that are strong and courageous and, and that don't sin and that do everything right, that are, that are without fault. It's a call to faithfulness not perfection. And so we can breathe this morning, guys. I'm not punching you in the gut. God has called fathers to faithfully lead and nourish their families. We're going to look at three aspects of faithful fatherhood from this text. And the first one is that a faithful father bears the spiritual responsibility for his family. To more fully appreciate the content of this psalm, let me introduce you to the man who wrote it. Asaph is generally the man ascribed uh, penmanship of this psalm and 12 others. And he was a Levite. He was, this was the tribe appointed by God to minister in the tabernacle and ultimately in the temple. Asaph lived during the reigns of David and Solomon, serving as a musician in the tent of meeting. He was not only a musician, he was also a songwriter, contributing, as I mentioned, 12 psalms to the Bible. Well, guys, what if I told you this morning that for the next 500 years, for the next 500 years, your children and their children and their children, and their children's children's children would faithfully serve the Lord for the next 500 years. Well, that's, that's the story with Asaph. That's his legacy. Asaph was not only a good songwriter, an excellent musician, he was also an excellent father. Listen to the legacy that Scripture records of Asaph and his descendants. First, First Chronicles chapter 15, verse 16, says that when David recaptured the Ark of the Covenant from the Philistines and brought it back into Jerusalem, the procession was marked by great celebration, great dancing, great joy. And in that celebration was Asaph wor worshiping with his symbols. Now, not long after that, Asaph was promoted by David from being the symbol player to being the chief musician. And watching and learning all along this time from their dad was his sons. Not much later, as David was assembling the musicians for worship in the tent of meeting, the sons of Asaph, his sons, were set apart to serve the Lord by prophesying with lyres and harps and cymbals. And the man appointed to oversee them was God's man, their father, Asaph. Asaph and his son served so faithfully under David that Solomon appointed them to serve at the dedication of the temple, side by side, father and sons, side by side. Asaph faithfully taught, instructed, and ministered with his sons, who in turn did that to their sons, and their sons, and their sons, and so on, on down the line for many generations, for 500 years. What a glorious legacy. About a hundred years later, during the reign of King Jehoshaphat, the Lord answered the king's prayer for protection from invading armies through a prophetic word that was given by Jehaziel, who was one of the sons of Asaph. And then another 140 years later, during the reign of King Hezekiah, it was the descendants of Asaph who were among the Levites who cleansed and consecrated the temple so that worship could again be conducted. Eighty years later after that, the great apostasy and the book of the law was found. King Josiah wanted to celebrate Passover once again. Guess who took their place as the musicians? The sons of Asaph. Then after 70 years of captivity in Babylon, nearly, nearly 400 years after the dedication of the temple, 400 years later, Ezra and Nehemiah record in the book of Nehemiah chapter 7 that when the foundation of the temple was laid, it was the sons of Asaph who led the worship. Ladies and gentlemen, for nearly 500 years, Asaph and his sons could sing of God's faithfulness because they heard it from their father, who heard it from their father, who heard it from their father, who heard it from their father, all the way back to Asaph, the man who wrote this psalm. What a rich legacy of God's grace at work through fathers. Fathers, isn't that the cry of our hearts? 
Isn't that what we want for our children, for our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and so on through the ages? Don't you cry out with me, Father, help me to deposit your grace in my children's hearts so deep that for generations they will tell their children and their children and their children and pass it on to those who are yet unborn. Asaph didn't just write this psalm. He practiced what he wrote in this psalm. God has called fathers to faithfully lead and nourish their families. Asaph and his ascendants were very purposeful. They were very intentional in the way that they took God's word and applied it, the way that they practiced family worship at home, the way that they served together. They were very serious and intentional in that. Fathers, how seriously do we take this call to bear spiritual responsibilities for our families? How seriously are you taking that call this morning? Clayton Barbo wrote a book on fatherhood and says this, the notion of responsibility is the crux of true fatherhood. The conscious sense of responsibility for the physical and spiritual well-being of others is the mark of a true father. John Piper is talking about a, another father in a biography that I read one time, and he says, a son is not a father's only life investment, but there is none like it. It's not all he's called to, but there's nothing like it. And when it fails, there is no sorrow like this sorrow. Psalm 78 makes the connection between fathers and their children multiple times throughout this passage, throughout this chapter. But the, the call uh, is repeated over and over again that the, the teaching is implicit that fathers bear spiritual responsibility for their families. This biblical call on the father to lead their families spiritually is not unique to the psalm. It's throughout the scriptures. It's not likely landing on you as some novel thing this morning that, uh, that God's word calls you to. But the, the, the foundational text that many of you know, I'm sure by heart, is Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. Dads, this should be a text that you return to often and repeatedly. It should be something that you seek to memorize and instill and apply in your lives. It says this. Deuteronomy chapter 6 says, And these words that I commend you today shall be on your heart. They should be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the, door on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is not, ladies and gentlemen, it's not a call to take cans of spray paint and literally write the words of God or to stencil it on all the walls of your house to be applied woodenly like that and without heart. This is a call. The pri it's a call to the primary context of parental instruction. It's the ordinary context of daily living in which we're called to disciple our families, in which we're called to lead our families, the normal experiences of daily life. When you're out to lunch and when you're at the store and when you're in, sitting at home and when you're tired, your children, it's the, it's, your children see the power of a life of faith as they see you living it, as they see you living out your own personal Life as men of integrity, living life in the rich, robust truth of the Word of God. It's a call to faithfulness. It's a long obedience in the same direction as one author wrote it. Robert Murray Machane, one of my favorite authors, says that what his people needed most was his own personal holiness. I love that quote, and I think it applies to us as dads. It applies to us as fathers, as husbands. What our wives need most, what our children need most, is our own personal holiness. Yes, we, they need our physical provision and protection and everything else. But we can tell our children all we want that they should walk in the way that the God calls them to. If they don't see us doing that, guys, if they don't see, if our kids don't see us reading our Bible and singing songs with enthusiasm, if they don't see us praying privately and publicly with them, they're learning more than what you're saying. John Patton uh, was reminded of, a, of another biography that I read, read uh, you know, a number of years ago. And John Patton, uh, in his autobiography, is honoring his father. And he's talking about this aspect of his father's leadership at home. It wasn't just the, 
explicit you know, moments of family worship, but it was his own personal example that meant more than anything to John Patton. Listen to what he says about his dad. He talks about this closet where his father would go for prayer as a rule after every meal. His father had 11 children who knew about this, and they reverenced this spot, and they learned something profound about God through this example of their dad. This is what Patton says about his dad. He says, Though everything else in religion were by some unthinkable catastrophe to be swept out of memory, were blotted from my understanding, my soul would wander back to these early scenes and shut itself up again, once again, in that sanctuary closet. And hearing still the echoes of those cries to God would hurl back all doubt with a victorious appeal, he walked with God, why may not I? He goes on later and says, How much my father's prayers at this time impressed me, I can never explain. Nor could any stranger understand when on his knees and all of us kneeling around him in family worship. And what a picture that is. He poured out his whole soul. He poured out his whole soul with tears for the conversion of the heathen world to the service of Jesus and for every personal and domestic need. We all felt as if, in the, as if in the presence of the living Savior and learned to know and love him as our divine friend. Fathers, don't underestimate the power of your example, just of you being you, men of integrity, living out your faith at home. Secondly, the, you know, they need our example. They also need our instruction. They need you to lead them. They need you to talk to them. And guys, most of the time when we're called to do this, it's times when it's not convenient. It's times when we're tired. A wise father, though, knows to talk to his children when they're in the mood, when they perk up. Every so often, they'll ask a question. It might be late at night, I'm chuckling because there's a dad in the room I know stays up until like four in the morning at times. He identifies these moments. They make a comment. They reveal some little aspect of their heart that you, you identify that and you cling to. And you say, okay, this is a moment that I need to drop everything else. I need to reorganize my time here. I need to take my to-do list. And I'm a fan of to-do lists. And I don't like getting off my to-do list, getting off my schedule. But I recognize these moments. I want to stop and say, okay, everything else stops. Let's, let me shepherd my child in this moment. We should teach and remind our children at every opportunity, both individually and collectively, but most important of all, we want to do it consistently. We want to be consistent in our application of this, and we need grace. So here's what that looks like for me. I have two jobs. It's the joy of my life to be a pastor in this church and to give full-time attention to this church as my job, and I love it. I love it. It also takes a lot out of me. And on top of that, I have a business that I run with employees and customers and, uh, and economic realities, a fluctuating economy that has bearing on our financial bottom line. So when I come home at the end of the day, especially if I've been outside, I live in Texas, I've lived here my whole life, and it's hot. It's hot right now. Amen? It is hot. I come home at the end of the day, I'm hot, and I'm tired, and I have a leather lazy boy in my living room that is attractive and I want to go in there and grab a nice glass of something cool and refreshing and plop down and relax and just settle down for the night. And if I'm honest, I want my wife to come and entertain me somehow. I want my children to do some kind of dance and tell me of all the amazing things that they learned. And I want somebody to take off my boots. <laughs> just being vulnerable. Am I the only one here? <laughs> But that's not what God has created us to do. I've got a wife. I've got five young sons, and they need me to lead them. My wife has been serving. I don't want to come home and compare my day to her day and tell me about, oh, you had a hard day? Let me tell you about my day. Let me tell you about the you know, frustrating customer out in the hot sun and, and all this. Well, that's not what I'm called to do. I want to come home and lead when I'm tired and I'm hot and I'm sweaty and I just want to chill. God calls us to lead and to lay down our lives for our wives. So here's what I do. Here's what I aim to do every day 
because I need this grace. When I'm on my best days, I pull in the driveway and I pray. Or maybe I stop before I get home because now somehow my kids know when I'm pulling in the driveway and they open up the garage door and they come running out and, and then they interrupt my prayer because they're excited to see daddy, which I love. I don't want to discourage that, but I need help. Because even when they're coming in and running and, and jumping up and, and tackling me, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa slow down, guys. I'm, hang on, man. I'm tired. I need, I need a minute here. And so I pray and ask God for strength to go into my house and serve. I want to go into my house. I want to look at my wife who's been serving her heart out all day long, uh, whether she's at home or if, if your wife is at work. Uh, I want to walk in the door, find my wife, and tell her how grateful I am. And I want to ask, how can I help? How can I serve? Do you want me to take over in the kitchen? Do I need to clean up a little bit? Do you want me to take over with dinner? Do you want me to take the kids and just, and just take them outside, take them away for a little bit to give you some peace and quiet because you've had them all day long? Do I need to address any of the kids for their behavior? Depending on all that, at some point, I'm, I'm playing with my kids. At some point, I'm down on the ground having tickle fights uh, with my two-year-old, my four-year-old, um, and I'm, I'm looking for creative ways to address their hearts. I'm looking for creative ways to draw them out and hear what's going on in here today. We have some kind of spiritual conversation at some point together. You, you do that in the mornings. You do that in the evenings, at some point having some kind of spiritual conversation, doing that at the dinner table, and then pray with them. Let them hear you praying with them and for them and interceding on behalf of others. Let them hear you pray. And at the end of the night, guys, I'm exhausted. And I fall down into bed. Maybe I collapse on the couch, and I, I turn on a show every now and then or, you know, whatever it is, my third one, you know third night in a row, and I feel the smile of God upon me as I look back and I think, okay, that was hard, and I'm tired, I'm exhausted, and nobody's worried about me, which is not true, but that's, that's the, the me monster within me saying, what about Aaron? But I feel God's smile upon me as I collapse exhausted into bed. That's a good day, and that's what God calls us to. I could take time. I was joking with another guy this morning. There's, I could, it would not be time poorly spent for me to just take time to tell you about men in this church that I know who lead their family as well, who've done this faithfully for decades, who are in the middle of it right now, men who I look to and learn from and am grateful for, uh, the diversity of men in this church who do this so well, model this for us. So guys, this morning, if this is an area that is new for you or just an area of ongoing struggle, here's what I want you to encourage you to do. If you have a community group this week or next week, whenever it is, you got your men's meeting, go to that and, and share that. Just be honest with the other guys because you're not alone. I need grace every single day to do this. And I'm a pastor. I do this full time. And I need help every day. Go to, your, go to the men in your small group and ask for prayer. Ask for help. And let's pray to God for a revival of men who take this seriously in our homes. God has called us to bear spiritual responsibility in our homes. Secondly, a, fa a faithful father aims for the hearts of his children. Look with me, if you will, at verses 7 and 8. So here you have Asaph sharing his burden, and he's contrasting it in both positive and negative terms. Positively, he says, we want our children to set their hope in God, remembering his works, and to keep his commandments. And negatively, he says that we should not, uh, we, we want them to not be stubborn and rebellious, whose heart was not steadfast and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Fathers are called to this task of spiritual leadership, of spiritual responsibility for the purpose of shepherding the hearts of their children and not their outward behavior alone so that they don't forsake the faith, becoming rebels and renegades and repeating the pattern that unfolds for the rest of this book. Asaph spends the rest of this psalm telling us about this pattern that happens over and over again about God's grace and then the people's rebellion and then God's judgment followed by God's mercy over and over and over again. So if you want to scan with me here, verses 9 through 16, uh, you see this um, your story of all these miracles that God has done that the people just forget. They just stop remembering and they just stop calling to mind. It's not that they literally don't remember like, uh, he did that? No, I don't, I don't remember that at all. No, it's just that it's not on their mind. They're not thinking about it. They're not meditating on that. They're not remembering and recalling it to mind. Verses 9 through 16, you have miracles forgotten. Verses 17 through 31, you have them just murmuring and complaining in unrest. Verses 32 through 39, you have this seem, you, you have this kind of facade of repentance that God calls meaningless. 
worthless. Verses 40 through 53, you have the people of Israel's ingratitude for God's deliverance. He does it, and then they just complain, and they're ungrateful. You guys read the Bible like this, like I do, like, guys, come on, get with it. And, it's, and that's my story too, though. It's not just them. In verses 54 through 64, you have the promised land, and they're ungrateful again. And then finally, in verses 65 through 72, we have the hope of a new beginning. So you just have this cycle over and over and over again of God's faithfulness contrasted with the people's failure and weakness and sin. They were continually neglecting God and his works and were consumed with themselves. They knew the works of God, friends, but that didn't lead to any lasting change in their hearts. It didn't, it, it, they had it in their heads, but it didn't touch their hearts, in other words. The goal of faithful fathering or faithful parenting in general is not simply the transfer of information. It's not simply telling them and having them recite things, but it's a process of, it's not information, but it's transformation that we're after. Does that make sense? Not information alone, but transformation. We use information to lead to transformation, but information alone is not enough. We want our children to set their hope in God. And so we're always evaluating. We're seeking to implement things. We're seeking to be faithful. We're seeking to, you know, whether you, you have a you know, concrete time, a family worship, or if it's kind of more of a kind of by the way, you know, I'm, I'm you know, going here and, and I think about something, I share this with, with this son or, you know, or this daughter or whatever it is. We're doing these things. We're always evaluating. Not, not simply are we doing it, but is this particular practice bearing fruit for this child in this season? It takes skill. It takes care. It takes constant looking at and evaluating and thinking, okay, is this working? It's talking to your wife and saying, what do you think? What do we need to be focused on? What am I doing well? What do I need to do different? The goal is transformation, and, and that's something that requires God's grace. It's more than what we can do on our own, and this takes time. It takes time. In, in a moment, I'm going to share something from, from Ted Tripp's book, but the my favorite thing about this book, and I still think that it's the most foundationally helpful book, uh, Shepherding a Child's Heart. It's the most foundationally helpful book that I've read on parenting uh, because it, you know, he just says things like, <laughs> parenting takes time. It's not convenient. It's not efficient. You can't you know, just do something and then, and then expect it to lead to amazing change. You can't tell your child you know, one time to do something and then expect that to just land and bear fruit and to blossom. It takes a lot of time, and it's inconvenient. It would be so much easier, wouldn't it, if we could just address their outward behavior, right? If we could just focus on their outward behavior and teaching them to act like well-behaved, good little people. I mean, am I the only person who's tempted to put on veggie tails on repeat and just let that go and go and go and let them teach, learn about not lying and about, you know, honoring their father? I mean, I definitely, you know, that's a good one for them to learn, we love Veggie Tales in our house. My favorite song, Veggie Tales, is the Ballad of Little Joe, also known as the Belly Button Song. If you don't know the song, go home and listen to it. And for everybody else, I'm sorry, I'm sure that that one's in your heads now. So all I'm about this morning is implanting songs in your heads. So we love Veggie Tales, but what we discover is that they're fun and they're clean, and, and you're all about like clean entertainment and stuff like that, and they're fun and they're clean and they teach good things, but here's what they don't do. They don't do the job of producing God followers. They don't do it. It's not enough. Veggie Tales will never give you a vision for the glory of God that will lead to transformed hearts. And, and don't take my word for it. I'm not slamming Veggie Tales. We have the whole collection, I'm sure. Phil Vischer the guy who created Veggie Tales came to the same conclusion. Listen to this. It'll be up on the screen. Phil Vischer says, I spent 10 years convincing kids to behave Christianly without actually teaching them Christianity. And that can, that can be true. I mean, that's a warning for us as parents. The danger that we always run into is confusing and teaching morality with the gospel. It's not enough. We, don't, we should not have it as our goal to have good moral kids who get good grades and they don't get in trouble and they never get arrested and they marry a good girl and have kids and, and live a decent life. That is not our goal. It's not. That is no different than the American dream. We need something more, and therefore, friends, we must aim for heart change. And that's hard. And it takes time. It's inconvenient, as I said. Faithful fathering takes time. Asaph got this. 
So he took the time in this chapter to show us how the people of Israel had the law and followed God outwardly, but they did not honor and love God in their hearts. That's why you see this fruit, you see this repetition time and again, is they hear things and they do things on the outside, but inside they're unchanged. They're like Paul described in 2, in 2 Timothy chapter 3. They were ever learning but never arriving at the truth. May that never be of our kids. May we never just teach and teach and teach and just assume that they're getting it without evaluating, inspecting the fruit of our discipleship in their lives. The way we live is an overflow of what's in our hearts. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, we act. We know this, right? And so that must be the focus of our parents. We need to direct not simply their behavior, but the attitudes of their hearts. Not just the what, but also the why. We must help our children understand that the way that God works is from the inside out. It's not that he focuses on cleansing the outside of the cup without, without worrying about what's inside. No, he works from the inside out. That's God's way. Ted Tripp, in his book, Shepherding a Child's Heart, says the central focus of child rearing is to bring children to a sober assessment of themselves as sinners. They must understand the mercy of God who offered Christ as a sacrifice for sinners. How? How is that accomplished? You must address the heart as the fountain of behavior and as the conscient and the conscience as the God-given judge of right and wrong. The cross of Christ must be your central focus of your child rearing. The cross of Christ. It's not enough to teach them to be good kids and obey the Ten Commandments and you know, to honor their mother and father and to be nice with their friends and not to tell lies and not to steal. We want our kids to set their hope in God to, to work in here. That's our aim there. Remember my friend uh, Bob Coughlin, I was teaching on parenting one time, and he said that the, uh, the primary objective of, of parents is to help their children establish well-worn paths to the cross. We need to establish well-worn paths to the cross for them because they're going to need to walk that road time and again, and they need to learn it first at home. They need to learn that from us. So we want to understand our child's inner struggles. We want to, we want to, we want to try to look at the world through his or her eyes. We want to understand. And this takes time. It's hard. It's a lot. It's a high calling. Knowing this, seeing this, will help you to know what aspects of the gospel are appropriate for this conversation. Because it's not a, it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's not the same truth every time. It's not just like you, set, you know, prioritizing the cross of Christ doesn't mean that every time you have a spiritual conversation, you say, okay, now remember that Jesus died for you, and he rose on the third day. It's, you want to change it up, and you want to think about, okay, now what aspect of this, what implication of the gospel bears weight here for this child in this moment, in this struggle that they're having. We want our children to know the breadth and length and the height and depth of the love of Christ and to worship as a result. And so we must take time not to focus simply on their outward behavior. I'm not saying ignore the outward behavior, but we don't simply focus on the, heart, on the outward behavior while ignoring their heart. We want the coin to drop, as it were. We want them to finally get it. And ultimately, this is God's work, but he calls us to play a part. So dads, take your kids out. You know, here's a good practice that I learned a number of years ago from another father is to take your kids out for one-on-one -on -one time together. Take them out for donuts or for coffee. Take them out for ice cream. Have fun. Tell silly jokes. Ask them for their best joke. I know the kids in here have good jokes, right? Anybody got a good joke? Yeah, come up and tell me afterwards because I need new material. I need new material because my kids are getting tired of the same jokes over and over again. So tell silly jokes, laugh a lot, have tickle fights. Show them the smile of God. I read a wonderful article this week called Show, Be the Smile of God to Your Children. Take an interest in what they're interested in and ask them serious questions. Ask them, what are you learning about God in this season? What's a struggle right now, son, that you're walking through that I can help you with? Sweetheart, where are you currently struggling and need help? What are you praying for God to do in your life in this season? Ask your kids these questions. Ask them when they're young, and they may not quite understand, but they, they grow, and that's how you disciple your kids. You set these as expectations of things that we should be considering, we should be thinking about, and take the time to listen and draw them out. Fathers, we're called to faithfully lead and nourish our families, 
And we do that best when we address their hearts. And finally, and this will be brief, a faithful father points his children to the faithfulness of God. We point our children, <laughs> as much as I want, my, I want to walk in the door and hear my wife singing Bonnie Tyler's song and saying, there he is, there's the hero. I want my children to be praising my name. I want them to, I want them to you know, just sing my accolades. And they do that. <laughs> but that's, as much as I want that, my job is not to point them into what an amazing guy I am, but how amazing God is. My job is more than that. It's not just not to think, not to teach them about what amazing guy I am. It's actually to be vulnerable with them and help them understand that I'm not that amazing. Because when your kids are young, they really do. You know, my, my kids are almost at that age where they're, they're seeing past that facade. Um, but the young ones in particular still think I'm like strong as Superman and all, and all that stuff. Um, and my job is to be vulnerable, to help them understand that, no, that's not, I don't want to set some ideal expectation for them that they will never measure up to. The rest of this psalm details the weaknesses and the failures of the people of Israel. And it's consistently contrasted with the faithfulness of God. So look, look with me at verses 36 through 39. Speaking of the people of Israel, these are the people of God who have been ransomed, who've been delivered it says they flattered him, they flattered God with their mouths, and they lied to him with their tongues. Their heart was not steadfast toward him. They were not faithful to his covenant. And this is mercy. This is grace here. Yet he, being compassionate, atoned for their iniquity and did not destroy them. He restrained his anger often and did not stir up all his wrath. He remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes and comes not again. Flip over with me, verses 68 through 72. These are the final verses of this psalm. We have hope given here. He chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, whom he loves, which he loves. He built his sanctuary like the high heavens, like the earth, which he has founded forever. He chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the nursing ewes, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, Israel, his inheritance. With upright heart, he shepherded them and guided them with his skillful hand. The reason for all of this is to give people hope, to show us time and again, the story of the people of Israel is one ultimately of their weaknesses and their failure to live faithfully to the covenant and God's faithfulness to a faithless people. That's the story. And that's the story that we teach our kids as fathers, is God's grace for weak fathers, God's grace for sinful fathers, God's grace for fathers who fail. Because that's my story. God will forever prove faithful. We want to teach our children not to set their hope in us, but to set their hope in God, Asaph says. Derek Kidner, commenting on this book, on this chapter, says, if Israel's record is her shame, God's persistent goodness emerges as her hope and ours for the unfinished story. Our children will struggle with weakness and failure their entire lives. And so as fathers, we must point them to the faithfulness of God and tell them that he is greater than all of our failures. We don't want to give our kids the impression that we have it all together, that we don't struggle, that we have it all figured out. No, we want to be honest with our kids and point them to him. It's not true that we have it all together, and it devastates them when they fail to live up to that expectation. Let's leave our kids in awe of God. Let's lead our kids in awe of God. Let your kids see you in awe. Let them hear you coming out of your bedroom, coming out of your, you know, your wherever you are, uh, singing. Let them hear you sing. But God, let them see you here on Sunday mornings singing with your full heart. More than anything else, we want them to know the love of God. And so our responsibility, our example are important, but ultimately we must point them to God. We must point them to the love of God. We want to teach them about his faithfulness. This means that we, we need to instruct them in his word. We want to give our kids a love for God's word. We want to give our children a love for his word and, a, and an understanding of this as the authority of over our lives. And we do that by reading it to them. We do that by reading it ourselves. We can't teach what we don't practice. 
So we must pursue this in our own lives. We want to help our kids learn how to lean on him and how to go to him with their sin and their weaknesses and their failures, how to walk that path to the cross. And we want to help them identify God's grace at work in their lives. We should be experts. What our kids should hear more than anything else, more than our criticism, more than our correction, what our wives should hear as well is our identifying God's grace at work. We should regularly be saying at the dinner table, let this be a practice, every once in a while, once a week maybe, Go around at the dinner table and say, okay, let's do this. I want everybody to share an evidence of God's grace at work in mommy's life. And you lead. And take time to really study that. Study, study the fruit of the Spirit. Where do you see that at work in your kids' lives? That's God's grace. That's not them. That's God's grace helping them to be patient when they struggle and they're irritable. Here's the thing that I've learned about fatherhood my first 11 years as a dad. I will fail. No matter how hard I try to be the dad that my kids need, to be the husband that Holly needs, I have failed and I will continue to fail. And it's real and it, it really affects them. They will bear real wounds for the rest of their lives because of my failure. And yet, praise God, somehow he redeems that. And he makes good of our worst. So guys, if you're here this morning just frustratingly aware of your weaknesses and aware that this is just not an area that I'm good at. This is not, I can't Bart disciple all my kids. Um, if you can, let us know. <laughs> Sorry. If you're aware of your weakness, and this is just, it's just an area, guys, that as I... Every men's group I've ever been in, you know, I say, okay, who's struggling in this area? And every hand goes up, All right? Nobody, nobody's like got this down. Bart doesn't have this down. He's great. He's amazing. I want to be like him. We all struggle in this area. So if, you, if you're discouraged this morning, if you feel like, like you've dropped the ball, like you're running this relay race and you've, and you've dropped the baton and you're not sure what to do, that's the point of this psalm. The point of the story of the people of God is that we can't do it on our own. But we proclaim not ourselves, but God. His faithfulness and the promise of a king better than David. This psalm ends with a promise of a shepherd like David. And that psalm points to the shepherd we have, the good shepherd, Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, our King. So go home today and enjoy your family. Thank God for the gift that your wife is and that your children are. And look for some time this week to sit down with your wife and, and to talk about it and share your burden, share these convictions, share where do you, you know, here's where I'm, here's where I'm burdened, here's where I want to grow. <laughs> and, and be patient as, and, and draw her out, ask, where do you think? Do you think these are the right ears? How can I grow? And listen and take notes. Confess to your kids that you haven't done this very well and that you want to change. And even by doing that, brothers, that is spiritual leadership. Even by saying this is an area that I've struggled in, and I'm sorry that I've let you down. That's spiritual leadership because it gives them an accurate picture of the Christian life. They're going to remember that those little moments where you're vulnerable with them leave lasting impressions, much more than, than all the explicit instruction you give them. They'll remember that time that, man, my dad was vulnerable with me that, that day, and that got my attention, and that left a mark that it's not up to me to be perfect, but to rely upon the faithfulness of God. And wives, as your, as your husbands do this, as they seek to do this, be patient and encourage and celebrate every little act that you can. Celebrate every leaning in the right direction. Okay, he's not sprinting yet, but he's leaning in the right direction. He's acknowledging this. And be patient and celebrate and encourage and build up. And kids, where are my kids? <laughs> your daddy needs grace just as much as you do. So pray for your dads. Help them. Encourage them. Because they love you. And they need God's grace. They need God's help just as much as you do. Well, as we close, if you're here this morning, today is painful because you didn't have a father who cared for you like this. Because you have, you know, uh, 
you know, maybe, maybe having a grasp of, of what fatherhood, of what faithful fatherhood even looks like is so foreign to you. Here's what I want to encourage you to do is to go home and read the Gospel of John. Read the Gospel of John and pay particular attention. Take special note of everything that is said about God as Father. We learn what fathers are supposed to be like by looking to our Heavenly Father. And we look, to, we look to Him by looking to Jesus, the one who brings us to the Father. This is a call to reflect upon the character of our Heavenly God in order to progressively reflect that character as we relate to our children and point them to Him. Here, If you want to change, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says the way we change is by beholding the glory of the Lord. By beholding the glory of the Lord, we are being changed passively. We are being changed from one degree of glory to another. So go home and behold the glory of the Lord. Lead your family in beholding that glory. We can only do this because of what he's done. And guys, we're going to stumble. It's hard. God meant it to be hard, but that's how much he loves you. It's so hard. He intentionally makes it so hard that we cannot do it on our own, but we must rely on his grace. We must have a lot of those driveway prayers. Let that just be a a pattern of stopping halfway down the street before you get home or stopping in the driveway and just pray and ask God for grace. I do it every day. I need it every day. Join me in that. It's worth it. All right, please join me in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. I thank you, God, for this amazing story of Asaph and his descendants. 500 years of your faithfulness to that man and his children. Father, I pray for all the dads in this room that you would grant us some measure of that blessing. Help us, Father, in our weakness, in our sin, in our frailty, Father, when we're tired, when we're fatigued. God, give us grace to lead at home. Give us grace to give our pictures, to give our kids a picture of the glory of God. Help us, help us, help them to set their hope in God. Father, I pray for, for every man in this room this morning who's struggling, for every woman in this room who's struggling because because dad died this year. We've just got this frustrating relationship right now, and it, it's an impasse. I just don't know what to make of it and what to do. Help us, Father, who are struggling because we want children, God, for those of us who, who've lost children. Father, I pray that you would pour out your grace this morning. Help us to go out of here, God, more aware of your grace. Help us be more aware of your faithfulness. Help us to set our hope in you, even as we call others to do. And when we've done it all, Father, we entrust our children to your faithfulness. As we sow seed and work the ground, we pray that you would bring the fruit. In Jesus' name we pray.